words. And um, uh, I guess I'll move over to our host and speaker. Thanks, Oyan. So, so for those of you that don't know me, I'm, I'm Roger Royce. I'm the founder of the Royce Law Firm here. Uh, the topic today is buying tax aspects of buying and selling a business, practical tax consequences. And this is actually um, an offshoot of a presentation I gave about a year ago to the statewide CPA, uh, uh, California CPA Society. And it was a very technical webinar, it lasted two hours. The opportunity came up to give, to give a similar presentation to the California State Bar uh, on Friday. And I thought we would use this tax salon forum as an opportunity to go through uh, some of the presentation on a little shorter, a little bit more abbreviated basis, but perhaps a little more technical since we do have, this is a tax salon, it's a technical tax group, theoretically. And we tend to do things uh, almost monthly, but it's more informal, it's interactive. Uh, feel free to jump in and you know, disagree with me, you know, make comments, ask questions as we go along. Uh, this is a, a good opportunity for all of us to sort of review some of the material. For some of you, it will be, it will be review. For, for some of you, it might be new. Um, before we start, I guess I'd like to get a sense as to, uh, there's a lot of new faces here, a lot of folks I haven't seen before. I wonder if we can maybe go around the room and you could tell me, introduce yourself, let me know who you are and what your background is, attorney, accountant, client, and so on. So we can start here. Um, my name is Jackie Maxon. I'm with Union Bank, and I'm with the Wealth Management Group, so I've worked with a lot of business owners. Okay. Yama? Hi. I'm Tamara Powell. I'm a partner at Structure Law Group in San Jose, and I do business and tax transactions. My name is Ken Goldman. I'm a CPA. I do a lot of transactional work. Okay. Yeah, good, good. To make it easy for everybody, GG. I'm Siemens Venture Capital and one of the partners there, so we can venture type in that. Douglas Park and Health Company solve difficult problems of strategy and corporate governance. Tim Boxen, I'm an attorney here at the Royce Law Firm. I do a lot of work with the uh, tax group, although I'm not technically a member. I'm here once. I'm Srinivas Nalamotu, I run uh, Package Red, we're a telecom software company in the Bay Area. I'm a partner at Dodie Barlow Britton Thomas. I do corporate mm -hmm. business transaction work. I'm Wanda Royce, and I'm a communication consultant. <laughs> I'm Joe Team, I'm an attorney. I work with uh, Annette and Dodie Barlow. We just do basically business transaction work. Sethi Jasmine, I work with Roger, business and tax group. I'm Dave Wittrock, I'm a tax attorney and CPA, although I my day job is a tax, corporate tax practice. Bethany Braga, I'm a CPA. I work for Essex Property Trust, the Color Creek. Mark Newman, work for Essex Property Trust also. Okay. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. So, what I'd like to do, we have a handout. I'm going to generally follow the slides. And I'm hopeful that what you'll come away with today is something that you'll find useful your daily practice as a sort of as a framework and as a means to analyzing transactions as they come across your desk and just how to put in place what sort of transaction it is, what the tax issues are, how it ought to be structured generally, uh, where you might have to call in other members of the team to assist, and, and how best to identify what the issues are. Because I don't know about you, but with my clients, these issues tend to come up very early when people are thinking about the business terms they've sort of soft sold it, and they haven't thought about structure, they haven't thought about taxes, uh, they just know they want to buy a business or they want to sell a business, and it's up to us to figure out how to do that. And I'm on slide number two, by the way, and the way that I like to think about it is, first of all, I want to categorize, is this something that could be a tax-free reorganization, or tax-deferred, or partially at least, uh, or is it clearly going to be a taxable <coughs> transaction? For me, that's the very first question we have to answer. Uh, <clears throat> if it's a tax re reorganization, we'll just walk through the alternatives as to what types of tax free organizations it can be and what the requirements are. Because maybe we can fit, maybe we can't, maybe we have to go back and, uh, and, and go ahead and, and restructure in order to make it fit. Chair right over here.
And uh, I also want to talk a little bit about some sp specific issues that come up in these sorts of transactions, some partnership techniques that we see and that we use, uh, some special concerns regarding us corporations, and special opportunities because there are ways with S-corporations to get results that you couldn't otherwise get. And then, of course, equity compensation is just everywhere in this valley and, and comes up in, in transactions as well. So again, I'm, I'm hopeful that with this, you can use this as an overall outline as to how to analyze and look at a transaction and sort of understand which way and how to go. The connection with tax-free reorganizations, this is my general this is where I'm going to start. I just want to put the boxes on, on the board to let you know how, how I tend to think about these. We have a parent, which is the acquirer. Oftentimes, will form an acquisition subsidiary. We have shareholders on a target corporation. So this is the basic pattern. So if you hear me say S, T, or P, that's what I mean. With regard to tax re reorganizations, there's really four kinds. Uh, the four, so the first thing we need to do is break these down into what, which of the four that we have. We have a merger, that's type A, a type B, which is just a stock swap, uh, a type C, which is a stock for assets transaction, or a type D, which is typically a split up or a spin off, but it could be acquisitive as well. And we'll go through these uh, in a minute in detail. But generally, the very first place, if we know we got something that looks like it might be tax free, for example, if we know there's a lot of equity compensation in the deal, a lot of stock, oftentimes you can do stock for stock tax free tax deferred, I should say. No tax until uh, the shareholders of the target actually sell the stock that they get paid. And by stock for stock, I mean that P is going to issue P stock to the shareholders of target. And when the smoke clears, P is going to own target. Okay? In some manner, either a merger, uh, stock deal, stock for assets, or whatever it is. So the very first thing we want to do is figure out what sort of, which of those four categories it fits into. Are we going to merge T into P or into S? Are we going to just trade stock? Are we going to have an asset transfer over So because we want to leave liabilities behind? And once we sort of get a general idea of what the possibilities are, the very first place we ought to go are to the ruling guidelines. Now, I've listed them there on slide number three. <coughs> and generally, uh, the IRS has, has guidelines uh, uh, of representations that they would request from a taxpayer to give a favorable ruling on a transaction, because they will rule on the taxability of corporate transactions. Um, we never get these anymore. I haven't done a ruling request in uh, you know, years, 10 years at least, maybe 20, because we've got these guidelines. We don't need an IRS ruling. We just go to the guidelines, and we can get very comfortable that if we fit, fit within these guidelines, um, that we're going to have a tax-free transaction. So the first place I start is I just sit down with the CFO we just walk through these guidelines and figure out if they're going to qualify under one of these transactions or how we might have to change the transaction economically to make sure we do. You know, we can probably get another chair here. Okay. So I've set forth the guidelines. You can take a look at them, uh, although you may find a good <coughs> summaries in some of the secondary materials as to how uh, some of these transactions work. So. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but let's just define the terms. So the next few slides I'll go through rather quickly. Uh, type A reorganization, that's just the merger. That's just T and the P, right? T merges with P, T goes out of existence. It is what is done most of the time, mergers, uh, because it's really easy. You just have to qualify under a statute. We call it a statutory merger, and we mean a state statute when we say that. Uh, two or more corporations combine, only one survives. Um, these days, the target can be foreign. You know, in the old days, it couldn't be. Target had to be U.S. But if you find a state merger statute that allows uh, merger with a foreign target, I can qualify as a uh, uh, as a tax-free transaction. There's no. You'll notice from the slide I say there's no substantially all requirement. What I mean by that, for a lot of reorganizations, uh, the acquirer has to acquire substantially all of the assets of the target. With a merger, you don't have that problem. So Target could spin off its unwanted assets and merge out the rest. And I should say it can distribute in a taxable transaction its unwanted assets and then merge the rest. You can't do that with other reorganizations. And there's no solely for voting stock requirement. Uh, so you could have cash and stock in a merger, and only the, the transaction would only be taxable if 
it's a good merger to the extent of the cash. That's a merger. <coughs> oh, let's pause on these requirements. Uh, there's really four things that are, these are common <coughs> themes in all of the tax re reorganization transactions. Continuity of interest, meaning that the shareholders who have an equity interest in Target to be tax-free, they have to continue their equity interest in the parent. Okay, that's continuity of interest to a certain extent. It has to be a business purpose for the transaction, not just for tax reasons. Uh, <coughs> there has to be continuity of business enterprise, meaning that the parent is going to conduct the business of the target after the transaction in some form, either by itself or through one of its affiliates. And then it has to be pursuant to a plan of reorganization. Pretty easy to do a merger, right? I mean, you can see it doesn't take a whole lot. You just find a statute and you, you comply with it. And uh, as long as you meet these four requirements, you're good. <coughs> Slide number five. What do we mean by continuity of interest? It means the shareholders of the target, uh, basically, they have to continue an equity interest, a meaningful equity interest in the acquiring company. Uh, tax lawyers argue all the time over what that means. Uh, the IRS says if there's 50% continuity, meaning that we get at least 50% of our currency and stock from the parent, the other 50% can be in cash, which if it's at least 50%, that's good enough continuity. Uh, there's a case that goes down to 38%, another case that goes down to 25%. <coughs> if you want a tax opinion, likely the tax lawyer will require it to be at least 40%. That's sort of a rule of thumb. That's not written down anywhere. That's just, that's just one of the reasons we get the big bucks is because we know that. Nobody will write that down. 40% uh, is generally the, the threshold uh, for a tax opinion, although you see it lower sometimes. 40% uh, of what? Whether it's how do you value the stock? <coughs> 40 per, ah, good question. We're, and I actually have some slides because there are some regulations on that specific topic. But I will tell you generally that it's 40 percent of the signing date, signing date value of what you get. So if we make a deal where we're going to have a transaction, so we get a 30-day deferred close, and you know, 500 thousand dollars of it is in stock and 500 thousand is in cash, that's good for continuity purposes. I guess. 50% continuity. Wait, is, is the guidelines how to value the stock in parent? I mean, in a private company, you can make up almost any number. Uh, yeah, no, the, the regulations are pretty specific on, on, on how you value, but you're right. There's always a little bit of a factual issue in there. With public company stock, it's Yeah, that's the difference. Of okay, private company stock, uh, if you've got a company that hasn't had a form I hate valuation, it's you would just use the good faith determination of the board and Nowadays, most companies should have four Yeah, they, they should have. You're absolutely right. Most of the time, the acquirer is going to be a public company acquiring a private company, and the 50% of whatever <coughs> continuity is measured at the, the buyers, from the buyer's perspective, as to what they're giving up to buy the target anyway. So you have the public company trading stock. All right. By the way, folks, I'm going to gauge this so we get finished by 1 o'clock. Everybody's busy and has places to go, so I might. Run through a little quick here or skip a slide or two. Uh, so figure about a minute aside. Um, post reorganization continuity. Um, it used to be that once the parent acquired, they could screw up the merger because they could turn around and resell the stock. If they screwed up the merger, it means the shareholders back here get taxed. It was kind of this funny scenario. I used to always ask for representations from the parent that they would do that, and then they would give them that they'd have a big confrontation. These days, it doesn't matter what the parent does post close, it won't affect the continuity, as long as they don't have that bad intent at the time of the acquisition. Slide six. Slide seven. Cody. <laughs> continuity of business enterprise. Um, point being that the parent has to actually conduct that business immediately after the transaction. And where you have issues under this, this is, this is pretty easy, right? They're, they're buying a business to Conduct the business. We have issues as oftentimes the parent will go and talk to their tax lawyers after the deal and say, gee, you know, rather than putting that sub down here and see, let's move it, you know, way over here to this other entity when we've got, I don't know, some losses we want to sell up or, or whatever it is they're doing. And these days, as long as it remains within the group, the group that the parent owns, we 
been moving around that group and it won't affect uh, continuity of business enterprise. I'll say one thing about business purpose, um, because you would think this is the easiest thing in the world. You know, how do you, how do you, you can always find a business purpose, right? Imagine how bad you feel <coughs> as a lawyer if you could come up with a business purpose. Uh, but keep in mind that it is a non-tax corporate level purpose for the transaction. And the tension here is usually when there's a real good shareholder level purpose, but not a really good corporate level. There are, you could probably imagine scenarios where that could be true. Because uh, the you know, parent would not have a good, a good corporate level purpose and just trying to help out the shareholders. That's a theoretical uh, scenario. Okay, type B reorganizations. That's stock for stock. It sounds like the easiest. Parent has trades parent stock for shareholder stock. It's the one we do the least often because it's the most difficult. And I'll tell you why. The reason why is because the rule is no boot in a bean, right? It's got to be purely stock, not one dollar of other piece of other property, cash, property, anything like that. And sometimes that sneaks up on you. The parent will pay the shareholders' expenses, and now you've got boot in your own deal. So almost never will you see a crash and scalp, rarely <coughs> will you see a bean reorganization. It's so much easier just to make it a merger and not have to worry about these hidden issues. Type C, 3 R. Stock for assets. Parent issues stock to target. Uh, assets go back to parent. And target liquidates. And stock of parent goes up to shareholders. Why do you think you would ever do it that way? And by the way, the parent has to acquire at least 90% uh, of the net assets and 70% of the gross assets of the target. So they'll have to acquire everything. All right? And it can assume liabilities, and that's not treated as boot unless it transfers cash as well, in which case all of the assumed liabilities are boot. And, and the reason that's significant is these transactions are taxable to the extent of boot. Why do you think you would do it that way? You want to avoid hidden liabilities. There you go. This is a corporate lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. want to avoid liabilities. So when you see it, or, or the other reason is if there's a regulatory reason that you can't transfer the stock to some point like a bank or something, sometimes you can't do it. But mostly it's for liabilities. This way you, can, you don't have to require substantial at all. Um, so, Roger, I have a question. You said the stock of the parent would go to the target. Mm -hmm. Can the stock of the parent also go to the shareholder committee? Yeah, directly? Well, that, that, well, it is. I mean, that, good question. <laughs> and uh, ideally, you know, and I've struggled with that myself because what's happening is a tax matter. Stock is going here, and then it's going here. But then people say, well, we don't want to have the certificate twice. So I said, well, okay, we'll just issue the stock right over here. But our plan of reorganization has to say, we're just doing that as a, as a ministerial matter. What's really happening is we're issuing stock for assets. That's a C. Uh, a D <coughs> is generally divisive. It's where, you know, it shouldn't even, it shouldn't even be up here except that it's under reorganization. And in a, in a D, what we do is we transfer to the subsidiary assets and distribute the subsidiary. That's a D. A spin off, a split off, or split up, depending on whether the shareholders of T are surrendering stock. Um, that's a device would be. I will just pause on that long enough to tell you that there are lots of requirements in order to be a device of D. The one that usually trips us up is the fact that the um, is that the business that gets spun off, as well as the business that's retained after it's been conducted for a five-year period ending on a closing date. Uh, and that's often not true, in which case we can't do this. Tax-free matter, uh, and then there are some other technical requirements that we'll get to. But in terms of mergers and acquisitions, though, uh, what I'd like to tell you about is what they call the acquisitive D, and that's where you use the D reorganization statute in order to actually do an acquisition. And if you look at slide number 11, that's what we call the non-divisive D. And the typical, and I almost hate to start down this path. 
because I'm sure you've all can remember a time when you've been in these seminars where it tends to get to be a little arcane, a little boring, and, and I've sat through hours and hours of you know, New York City lawyers and 500 lawyer firms who will actually see this stuff and none of the rest of us will. And we just draw boxes on boards all day long because you know there's the only limit to the number of transactions that is, is the limit to your imagination. That's what you can come up with. And there are rules out there for almost all of them. But there is one I do want to tell you about, because this one you will see. And that's where A owns 100%, actually more than 50%, Corporation <coughs> B and Corporation C. And we actually have a transfer of assets between the two. And then whatever other magic the corporate lawyers do, they just do. At the end of the day, A still owns everything. Maybe stock went this way, that went this way, maybe it went straight up, whatever it is. That's a non divisive deal. Um, that's a non taxable transaction, is what I'm saying. Why, do, why am I pausing on it? Because sometimes you slip into that without knowing it. Sometimes that's not exactly the result that you want, but you end up with it. And that's what slide 11 is. Uh, it's called liquidation reincorporation. You may remember a time when you've had clients come and say, gee, I want to liquidate this company and then reincorporate because I want, to, I want to soak up all my NOLs and I want to get a high basis on liquidation. I'm this and that, put the other thing over here and I'm going to have all this basis. Well, it doesn't work. The D statute comes along and stops it. And that happens more often than, than you might think. That's the non divisive thing. Think of it as also the liquidation reincorporation doctrine. Um, and there are some more examples uh, on 11 where that gets you one other way is what we call a failed C. This, this goes the other way. When we tried to do our C reorganization, but it failed because we didn't meet all the requirements, because A had 50% prior or and it took us a D anyway. So again, it's a path I hate to even start down, because you can see that with enough rules, where's my mathematician in the room? With enough rules, you can probably, you know, probably figure that there's an exponential number of scenarios we can come up with. Um, page 12, one thing I, I skipped over uh, a little bit on all of this are the consequences. Uh, and, and I've given you the code sections on page 12, uh, but generally, if all this goes according to plan, shareholders, they only have gain, to, taxable gain to the extent they get cash. Um, Target should have no taxable gain uh, in any sense. He has no gain because they're just issuing the stock, so they're protected. Uh, and of course, S uh, similarly has no gain. We have a complete carryover of tax attributes, uh, meaning bases, holding periods, things like that from, from the acquired company. Uh, that's if everything goes according to plan. And those basic principles apply to all the rewards with yeah. carryover basis, no gain, et cetera. Yep. Okay, I want to tell you about two other ones before we're finished defining terms. Um, almost always, you notice I have three boxes up here and not, uh, and not two. And the reason why is that almost always <coughs> in a reorganization context, I shouldn't say almost always, but often, in my practice anyway, uh, it's a triangle. In other words, it's not P acquiring T, merging with T, because He's not quite sure they want all the assets at T. Just don't think of think how bad P would feel if it turned out picking up some big environmental liability or something like that. So instead, it'll form a subsidiary and have T merge with the subsidiary. So if something does really, really go wrong, you know, those assets, and those liabilities are isolated down at this. <coughs> so it's almost always as a triangle. And the statutes, tax statutes, expressly allow that. It can be a forward. Uh, or it can be a reverse. A forwards where S survives, and a reverse is where T survives. Most of the time, we do it as a T. And that is for uh, a corporate succession reason, uh, I, I would call it. I mean, as a legal matter, it's still a merger, but if you have a different entity that's now the employer, uh, I think you probably need a different ID number, a tax ID number, or the contracts can have a different name on it. It just tends to be a little more problematic. If it's just a T, it's just like a stock sale. Here's the tax trick, not tax trick, but the tax issue. Uh, in both cases, you 
can do both of those as a tax-free transaction. But it's harder to do a reverse because you have to have 80% continuity. In other words, 80% of the consideration here has to be stock of P, right? Um, if it's a forward, remember what we said about general and continuity, it has to be 50%, so a little harder. So you might say, well, gee, why would we ever do it this way? It's just a forward. Well, if you fail, you blow it. If, you, if you, something goes wrong and it ends up not being a T, treated as a taxable stock sale, which is one level of tax, the shareholder level, okay? It's not so bad, just one level of tax. If it's a forward and you screw it up, and it fails for whatever reason, you've got two level of taxes because a failed forward merger is treated as though uh, there were a sale of assets uh, to S, followed by a liquidation. So that's two levels of tax, once at the corporate level, once at the shareholder level. So you almost have to pick your poison depends on how good you feel about uh, your facts on a reverse as to whether you'll do that or not. <coughs> Does everybody follow that? And you know where it becomes an issue, and you're, you're probably wondering, well, why is this such a big issue? You should know whether you got 80% of it, but what you can do with that. Well, it becomes an issue, we'll talk about earnouts later, which are hard to value. Uh, it becomes an issue most of the time, when I've seen people have to flip a reverse into a forward at the last minute. Uh, well, first of all, it's because they didn't call any tax lawyers until the last minute. <laughs> and when they did, they found out there was shareholder debt here. You know, and we're always nervous about shareholder debt. I mean, is it really debt or is it equity? Because if it's equity, then it's a class of stock. And we have to get 80% uh, stock for stock. And that's usually not what happens. I mean, the debt just gets a single and goes away. Of all classes of stock. And that's something that usually uh, causes us to get nervous enough to force it into a forward. Okay, those are the trends. <coughs> all right, now, before we move along into some of the, I guess, the newer things or the things you might not know, uh, no, net value rules, uh, page 19. No net value. Um, there are now proposed regulations that make it pretty clear that if you have an insolvent T, we're seeing this a lot lately, as you can imagine, debt in excess uh, of basis, or excess of value rather, there's not going to be any meaningful stock being exchanged, right? If all that happens is S assumes liabilities and, and takes assets and maybe issues one share that's just not going to be a good reorganization. That's a sale. That's a sale. That's the net value rules. And the reason that I'm pausing on it now is because, not only because there are proposed regulations, it's because that's much more likely to happen. It probably was last year than it is now. There are still insolvent companies out there. So it's one of those places <laughs> where you might think you've complied with all the technical rules, but you really haven't. Just imagine what that feels like. We find out that you've gone through all these documents and say this is a merger, this is tax free, and no net value rules uh, give you a different result. Page 20, uh, section 382. Uh, I'm sure Dave could talk all day about 382 since he does the studies. But generally, one of the consequences of this merger transaction is succession. So if T has a bunch of net operating losses, S is over here with, with its mouth watering or getting those net operating losses to offset its income. Well, 382 is going to limit that severely. It's about a half of 1% per year of the value uh, of, of T is the amount of its own net operating losses it can use. Uh, and when 382 applies, it's if there's an ownership change within more than 50% change in ownership over the past three years. And not only is this transaction an ownership change, might have had one before them. So oftentimes, the 382 study is required as part of the due diligence to make sure that T doesn't have a tax liability that you didn't know about. But for purposes of, of acquisitions, buying and selling business, <coughs> just assume, you can pretty much safely assume you're not going to get T's net operating losses. So don't be placing a value on them. Page 21. 
uh, preferred stock, uh, preferred stock is not always stock. Right? Non-qualified preferred stock can be treated as boot in some cases as opposed to stock. It won't count for continuity purposes. Uh, and the tax definition of preferred stock is not exactly the same as maybe the VCs might think of it. Preferred stock, I know the preferred stock that we think about here in the Valley, uh, it, it, it might have a conversion feature, so it does participate in growth, or at least we view it as participating in growth. For our purposes, preferred stock is something that's not so much preferred as kept. It looks a lot like debt. That's non qualified preferred stock, and the tax law will treat that with this economic substance. Uh, in other words, not as equity, but more like debt. Which is bad, because it might trigger tax, or exactly. tax on the transaction. Exactly. Thanks, Unless you have you. real debt on the other side matching up, or something like that. Well, what a segue. Mm -hmm. Slide 22. What happens if it is debt? What happens if you do have something other than stock going back and forth? Okay, you can do a tax-free exchange of almost anything, it seems, you go down the list. You can do warrants for warrants, you can do warrants for stock, you can do stock for warrants, and you can do securities for warrants. Uh, but what you can't have uh, tax-free uh, is a security that has a, a principal amount that's less than the security that you receive. In other words, if you look at 23, slide 23, like I say, target securities, which what we mean by that is long-term debt instruments, for P securities is tax-free, except to the extent that you basically were reducing the amount of the principal amount of the debt that targets issue, because that's a lot like forgiveness of, of, of indebtedness. So to the extent, and by the way, uh, there's a mistake on the slide, or on slide 23, where it says, it's not taxable to the extent that the principal amount of P debt does not exceed the principal amount of target debt. Um, if anybody in here can tell me what that means, then, uh, you're smarter than I am. Uh, but I don't want to know because it's wrong anyway. It should be. <laughs> to the extent that the principal amount of P debt is less than the principal amount of target debt. In other words, when the smoke clears, if our new target owes less <coughs> debt than it did before, we've got cancellation of debt. And that's all we're saying. So why am I pausing so much in that? Because a warrant is treated like a security with a zero principal amount. So a warrant for debt will trigger income. That's the only place where this really comes up and you really worry about it, other than if you actually have target bonds that have a principal amount uh, that's greater than the bonds. Do we need to pause on that? Okay. Page 24. Um, this is one of those really interesting, but maybe a little bit arcane uh, issues about dividend equivalency. Remember how I said if we, we only recognize gain to the extent we have cash in the deal? Well, there's, there's gain and then there's gain, right? And these days, uh, we've got capital gains, which are taxed at one rate, and dividends, which are taxed at another. Uh, unless you have all of, actually these days they're taxed at the same rate, aren't they? That's all gonna change on December 31. Uh, and when it does, slide 24 will, be, will become important again. What that says is that we have to test the amount of cash. And the way we test it is we have, we have our merger, our acquisition transaction. Shareholder gets a little bit of cash. Okay, it's got gain in the extent of the cash. Is it capital taxed at 15%? Is it ordinary taxed at 35 We just have to engage in this hypothetical transaction where shareholder gets stock first, and then they sell that stock back to me for the amount of cash. Now, the reason we do that is we want to see how much shareholders' interest in me has decreased. Because imagine if you're a shareholder and you own 100% of a company and they redeem some of your stock. It's not really a redemption, is it? You still own 100%, you just got cash. So that's not a sale, that's a dividend. So that's the test we go through. This is the real team test. And um, it's just one of those details that we have to take into account and pay attention to because everybody just assumes it's all capital gain on these transactions. It's not always the case. That's slide 24. <coughs> you know, and by the way, I'll, I'll go through uh, a lot of the stuff that's really, it's really more compliance, uh, but we're all lawyers here, or most of us are, and 
a little concerned about our structuring, and drafting, and issues to watch out for. I wonder if the team members in. And when we get to that, I'll pause a little bit on some of the things we do. But I do want to hit major tax issues. Slide 25 is one of those. Section 306. Section 306 uh, is, uh, I'll tell you about the transaction that's intended to address uh, in a minute, but just by definition, it's preferred stock that a shareholder receives uh, that if it had been cash, it would have been a dividend. If it had been cash instead of preferred stock, it would have had a dividend, but they got preferred stock in a non-taxable stock dividend. That's 306 stock. What does it mean? It means when they turn around and sell the 306 stock, we're going to have ordinary income. And the transaction that's aimed at is where it's what they call a bailout, where shareholder, you know.